Amen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you today? It's good, 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 good. It is the day that the Lord has made, and it is a great reminder. Appreciate it, Andy and the team leading us in worship this morning and orienting our hearts. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Listen, it's a joy for me to be with you today. I appreciate it, Jim, and uh, the introduction. I've been at New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, for 13 years now. Uh, and, and we've been through a lot as a church, been through some challenges, some transitions, some tragedy with um, uh, a shooting on our campus, you know, six years ago now. I mean, there's been a, a lot to this journey that we've been on. And by the grace of God, the church has continued to, um, to survive, but more than survive, to heal and to, uh, to thrive. But you know, in the midst of it, we've had the opportunity to ask ourselves a lot of difficult questions about what it means to be the people of God. We've had the opportunity to ask ourselves lots of questions about what it means to be a pastor or to be a leader or to be a worship leader, to be on the tech team or whatever it is, whatever our roles are. And I keep finding myself coming around this question over the last few years that, that really is maybe at the center of all of this, and that is, what is the gathered church for? What is it for? Why are we here? Why do we do this when we gather on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning? Why do we gather together? There's a lot of conversation about this and a lot of people who have different uh, ideas about how to answer this question that we're trying to wrestle with. Maybe one group kind of says, you know what, the word that we need to, to hear or the, the word that we need to say is the word mission. That really the gathered church is all about mission. And so you, you think about people that say, all right, so really the gathering is just to equip you so you can go out and, and, and have the, the scattering. And some of you may have heard that lingo. And so the mission kind of takes center stage. Where everything we do on Sunday mornings is about this, is about reaching the lost at any cost or letting people hear the gospel and all of that. And so we have voices of leaders that say to us, listen, it doesn't matter what you do on Sunday morning, the whole goal is to introduce people to Jesus. So tell the gospel, preach the gospel, but get them there with whatever gimmick or trick you need because, hey, it doesn't really matter. As long as you can attract them and bring them and as long as they're there, then we can kind of, you know, give them the message. And we don't realize the way that we are maybe using a bit of a bait and switch trick. Where we say, let's call, let's, let's draw them in with these sort of impulses, but then let's try to ask them to take up their cross after we've given them their latte. But mission is kind of the primary thing. And so everything we think about with the church then or Sunday mornings is mission. But another group says, well, I don't know. I don't know if we want Sunday mornings to be taken over by mission. I mean, it's also for, for believers. And so, and so then we have people that say, I, I tell you what, I tell you why we gather together as a church. It's really about expression. It's really about expression. It's about all of us kind of coming together and expressing our hearts to the Lord and we're lifting up one voice and we're kind of doing the, 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 you know, the, the, the music thing and the Bible thing and it's all there so we can express our hearts to God. And in some ways, this is the, this is the way of kind of saying, okay, look, the upward movement in our services is really the important movement. The upward movement from our hearts up to God, this is where it's all about. It's expression. And so working with that lens, we say, okay, well, if it's all about expression, then you know, it really doesn't matter what this person says or that person says or what these people are doing or that, because it, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, hey, we're all different. We've got different styles. We want different uh, you know, setups and all of this stuff. And so as long as it helps people express their heart to God, does it really matter? Saw a piece that was floating around the internet a couple months ago that was sort of critiquing or criticizing a certain view and saying, does it really matter whether we do rock and roll or if we have robes and incense? I mean, does it really matter? We're all just here to kind of express our love for Jesus. And it very much approaches church through the lens of expression. The reason we gather together is to have this upward movement of our expression to God. Now, I want to say to you today that there is something true about both of those words. There is something true about recognizing that when we gather, there is an element of mission to what we're doing. There's no doubt. 
And there is, in fact, also an element of expression. If you're a visual person, you could think of the arrow kind of going in for mission. We're drawing people in. For expression, you say there's this arrow that's going up. We're here for God, we're here for God, we're here for God. But we can use whatever expression or style we want. These are just style differences. But I want you to imagine with me the other, another arrow, an arrow that comes down. And the word here is formation. The church, the gathered church, when we come together, whenever we meet, the gathered church is here for formation. Now, some of you I've already lost because I've used the word worship to talk about the gathered church. Now, some of you are so familiar with people saying, now worship is more than what we do and on Sundays and it's more than what we sing. No doubt. But sometimes it's not helpful to take a word and then expand it so large that it loses any meaning. And so, yeah, worship is about obedience. Of course it is. And it's true that biblically, the worshiper and the obedient servant are kind of overlapping concepts, no doubt. But there is also something true about the gathered church and worship and calling that worship. Psalm 95, come and let us worship the Lord our God, our maker. There's, some, there's this call to come together. And I wonder if in the midst of talking and thinking about church as mission, or thinking about church gatherings as expression, that somewhere in the midst of this we've said, we've, we've been left scratching our heads saying, and where does worship fall into this? And so then we say, well, we, we, it doesn't, it's, not, it's all worship, so it doesn't matter. And so now we have a whole generation of young people whom we've spent the last 20 years saying it's all worship, and they've said, thanks, then I'm gonna go hiking on Sunday. I got my iPod, got a podcast, got the new Hillsong album, I'm good, thanks. So, so, well, I mean, I guess it's not all worship. There is something special about why we gather. Why is it? And then we're left scrambling. We say, I, I know why we gather. We gather because we've got to win the loss. So you need to come to church so you can bring your unsaved friends to church. Okay. So, well, I'm actually, there's more unsaved friends that I meet outside church. So I'll, I'm fine where I am. Oh, well, the mission thing, that's not a big enough bucket, is it? Well, oh, okay, it's, it's expression. You need to be able to express, well, you know what? I don't really like my, the way these churches express worship to God. I mean, that's not my style. This guy speaking is not my style. This band is not my style. That building is not my style. So it's not my expression. So I'd just rather not go. And so here we are because we've only described the church gatherings through the lens of mission or expression, where we've been left with no category, no framework, no way to say to people, and this is why the people of God gather. Because they're saying, well, I got mission on my own, I got expression on my own, I've got my favorite band on my playlist, I've even mixed up a few different bands on my playlist. It's all my expression. But this other word, formation. This other word, formation, is a good corrective. It's not to say that there's not an element of mission or expression, but it is to say that the word formation, I think, is the neglected piece. You see, the early church fathers have always believed, or, or believed rather, they, I suppose they continue to believe, that the way that we worship together, the way that we pray together, the practices that we do together, end up shaping our faith. The way that this was said by the early fathers in Latin is this phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith, or the rule of prayer is the rule of faith. And if you know kind of what the, these old, old ways of describing it, old words, even to say the rule of prayer, what that means is when you say the rule of is not like the laws of, but an order of service, or the order of prayer. The, the way that we all pray together becomes the way that we all believe together. So the truth is, whether or not we talk about our church gatherings, the gathered church, as being about formation, guess what? It is. And so the question is not, are people being formed as they come to church? The question is, how are they being formed? How are they being formed? You say, well, Glenn, I mean, I... I 
I think it's pretty clear how they're being formed. I mean, we have Sunday school and we have Bible teaching and we have, you know, very good songs and all of this stuff. Without realizing it, we are living with a lot of leftovers from the Enlightenment worldview. And what I mean by that is this specifically, we believe that human beings are primarily what we think. We believe that human beings are primarily cognitive, that our cognitive dimensions are the only thing that shape us. Can I say to you that that's not true? That actually in lots of, of fields from the social sciences, psychology, all of these fields are coming back to something that the church fathers knew from the early centuries. That what shapes our faith is more than the cognitive things. It's more than the words that some talking head on a screen is saying to you. What shapes us are the repeated practices and habits, and things that we find ourselves doing over and over again, even if we can't fully explain it. I'll give you an example. My wife is from a small town in Iowa and uh, her father is a farmer and it's a, it's a quaint, very charming town and I love going there and it's, a, it's like the opposite of our lives and so we love going there, you kind of unplug, except for now they got internet so now I'm Instagramming farm pics which is really kind of defeats the purpose. But, but this, this last summer we were there and we have, my wife and I have four kids from eight and a half to one and a half. And so it's, life is full, it's fun, it's exciting, you know. And our six-year-old this summer went, while we were there got sick. And she had this fever and we we're like, oh man, we need to get some, some Tylenol, children's Tylenol or something. And, and uh, my wife was dealing with, with our youngest, the baby, and, and she said, Glenn, can you just go to the, the, you know, the, the local drugstore and pick up some children's Tylenol and you know, all of this stuff. I'm thinking, sure. So I said, hey, honey, where, where's the drugstore in your town, you know? Because it's a town of no stoplights, you know. There's just one blinking light, and there's one kind of main strip. And so I just thought, okay, I, it's not going to be too hard. But where where is it again? And she said, oh, it's on Main Street. I said, okay, Main Street. I'll be sure to find it. And then I, I on my way out, I asked her mom and said, Roxanne, where's where's the drugstore? She goes, Main Street. Okay, great. I'm in the car. I'm driving, and I see her dad out in the field. Say, hey, Bill, I'm, I'm headed out. I'm going to go to the drugstore, Main Street, right? And he goes, Yep, Main Street. I get into town and I find a street that says Main Street. And I turn right on Main Street and you know what it was? It's a row of houses. I'm thinking there's no way. The pharmacist is here, there's, this is houses and I'm, I'm driving around and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, and I pick up my cell phone, I'm trying to call, they're not answering. I'm like, where is this thing? And finally I'm weaving around and I realize, oh, here's this whole row of where the bank is and the Lutheran church and then the other church and then, you know, where all these different things are, it's all on the same street and there's the drugstore and guess what? It's on Reed Street. That is not Main Street. I walked in and I got one and I came back and I said, hey guys, I just want to tell you, it's not on Main Street. Don't know if you knew that. And they all looked at me and they're like, oh, well, we just call it Main Street. Like it's, yeah, it's Reed Street, isn't it? Or they're, they're, some of them, I think my wife didn't even know, what street is it actually on? There is a way, and you know this about your own towns and your own neighbors, there is a way that you just, you've learned a town because you've driven it because you've walked it, because you've ridden your bike through it, and you've never studied the grid or whatever, the lack of a grid of the way the streets are organized, right? You know what I'm talking about? Where if you had to plot out what street comes after which street, you're like, man, I don't know. But if I get in my car and I take a left here, they go, I, 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 just let me drive, I know where I'm going, right? There are, there are things that we learn that we don't just learn because cognitive data has been put inside your head. You learned it by repeatedly doing it, by driving those streets, by playing in those streets, by cycling on those streets. This is one of the ways that we learn faith. We don't just learn faith by someone saying, here's 10 keys, memorize this, you've got it. We learn faith by the rituals that we do or don't do every Sunday. So I wanna take this, this and challenge us with a couple of things. James Smith is a philosopher at Calvin College and he talks about, he uses this phrase, a cultural liturgy. Now some of you are thinking, what, what in the world is that? Think of liturgy in this broad sense, a repeated, a, a set of rituals done by a group of people repeatedly, okay? Communal rituals, liturgy. And he says there are cultural liturgies and I've, I've been thinking through a few of them. 
For example, I am a Denver Broncos fan. Now, if you're a Cowboys fan this Sunday, I just want to warn you, Peyton Manning's coming to town. I'm a Broncos fan and I have a friend who conveniently happens to have season tickets. And so every year we try to go to one game and when we go, we have the same ritual. We begin to prepare our hearts. We begin to say, I was glad when they said unto me, it's game day. And we get in the car and we journey up and we've got the pregame radio tuned in. And I've got the right attire. I'm dressed in the robes of righteousness, AKA my orange sweatshirt. And we go and we park at the same obscure spot because it's free. And then we walk through some different neighborhoods and possibly some back lanes. And and then we make our way to KFC because we never eat KFC except on game day when we're going there. We get our bucket of chicken and potatoes and and we go, we have this rhythm and everything is reinforcing. It's like, here we go, we did this, yep, it's game day. And we get in and the worshipers, I'm sorry, the fans are there (laughs) in mass and they're they're all wearing the colors and we look at one another, we don't know each other, but man, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, I mean, in the Broncos. I look at their orange and blue, they look at mine and we know. And we know that by the end of these th- you know, three hours, we'll be hugging and jumping and slapping high fives. And we don't even know each other's names. But we're passing the peace of the Lord. I mean, the, the joy of the Broncos. We're one in this arena. This is a cultural liturgy. There's another cultural liturgy some of you may be familiar with. It's the rock concert. You go, you get your tickets, you go in, and I've, I've only been to one concert my whole life. I know, strange, but there you go. So I don't know this liturgy as well, but I imagine it's something similar. You go in and the throngs of people, the fans are coming in and you walk through the, you know, into the stadium or the arena or whatever it is and you find your seat and you get in and there's this haze and you're not sure if the haze is smoke or something else and, and you're, you're there and the lights come on and the pre-show music kind of fades and there's some sort of dramatic open and then, you know, boom, the spotlight comes on and there's Bono, which is the only show I've been to and, and all of a sudden it's electric and you feel the bass thumping in your chest and you're not sure if it's adrenaline or just like some sort of biological reaction to the subwoofer and all of a sudden your equilibrium is being thrown off a little bit but you're feeling like God this is awesome what a great and the mass euphoria takes over maybe another cultural liturgy that all of us would be familiar with is the shopping mall we drive in Behold, a large temple with gigantic doors and tall ceilings that tell us that everyone is welcome. And as we walk in, there are smaller prayer chapels all along the sides. And each chapel has their own icons of their saints. The Gap Chapel has a khaki wearing saints with, you know, with, with a, you know, a blue sweater or something, you know, or stripes, that's kind of the Gap thing, you know or colored jeans, and these saints seem to say to us, be like me. You too can be like me. And we walk, we find the chapel that we've been looking for based on the saint whom we most adore. And we walk in and we browse the racks for the relic we've been searching for. And we find it, there it is, skinny jeans. And we come to the altar, ready to give our gift (laughs) in exchange for the magical power of being hip once again. And we do this with every season. In fact, the saints seem to be adorned in new colors for each season, inviting us in. Now I joke about this. But a cultural liturgy, a liturgy in general is designed to aim your love at something. A sporting event is designed to aim your love toward a team. It's it's designed to make you a fan. A rock concert is designed to make you a spectator. The shopping mall is designed to make you a consumer. Now I ask you this, 
what happens when the church begins to use cultural liturgies? What happens when the church says, okay, we gotta learn from the world of entertainment, we gotta learn from the world of professional sports, we gotta learn from the world of, the, the, of marketing and sales, we gotta learn from this and we're gonna use all these things and maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously or unconsciously even, we find ourselves weaving together a church service and we call it an experience, but what we've really done is lifted a cultural liturgy from the world and then we've called it church. And then we say, I don't know why Christians nowadays are just fans of Jesus. Maybe because everything about our cultural liturgy is shaped at making them a fan. And we scratch our heads and we say, oh, Christians these days, they're just, they're just an audience. They're not worshiping, they're just watching. I wonder why. Everything about the room imitates the cultural liturgy of a concert. And then we wonder why they are not participants, but they are spectators. You've borrowed a cultural liturgy that was perfectly designed to produce that kind of person. And then we say, well, Christians, American Christians are such consumers, man. By the way, if you come to our church, we have childcare that does da 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 da. It's awfully quiet. We borrow these things, these cultural liturgies, and then we're surprised that they actually work to form people in a particular way. Liturgies form people. They do. The liturgy of the mall forms you as a consumer. The liturgy of the rock concert forms you as a spectator. The liturgy of the, of the sporting event forms you as a fan. Borrow these liturgies in church, that's what you will form your church into. Now that's not a popular thing to say because we don't like that. I like this stuff. I wanna use this stuff. I see the Grammys and I want my sun Easter Sunday to look like that. It is a tragedy that the people who shape our church services know more about the Grammys than they do about the church fathers. It is a tragedy that our worship leaders and tech leaders and pastors could tell you more about pop culture than they could about the historic liturgies of the church. Because friends, that's not being relevant, that's forming people in the wrong way. Now this is the closing session, so I'm not gonna hold back from you. I wonder if we've pushed a false dichotomy between message and methods. I know the theme of this event is never changing message, ever changing methods. And there's some truth to that. We do recontextualize in every era and in every that we do and we're supposed to. There's some parts of methods and methodology that's neutral, it's true. But I want to challenge you to think more deeply about that. I wanna challenge you to say Maybe these things that we're doing in, in our church services are not as neutral as we think. Maybe many of them are actually forming people in deep and profound ways and we don't realize it. We think I can have the trappings of a concert as long as the, mess, the, the, the sermon is the gospel and people will get it. And throughout church history, church fathers have said, actually, why don't you just make it all work together? So that's what I wanna say. The answer is not to say, all right, okay, Glenn, what are you saying? We should like not have lights? I mean, don't you realize this is kind of a tech conference? Did you read the brochure? I mean, there's, we got lights and screens and sound stuff. I mean, do you think we should just go like acoustic and barefoot and sing Kumbaya? I mean, come on, man! We don't all live on a commune. <laughs> Neither do I. I'm a staff at a large church with a large production budget and good stuff, good equipment. And we, we are an extension of that now. New Life Downtown is an extension of New Life Church. But in a different way than we're used to thinking about campuses, uh, we tend to think of it a little bit more like a parish in that there's some places of unity, our budgets are combined, our values are shared, the pastor of the main campus and me, we meet, we're good friends, we meet during the week several times. We preach out of the same series together, the same text together, but our outlines are gonna look different. 
There's a, but then there's also a high degree of, of, of um, freedom to say, all right, why don't you shape this around what God is doing in your people and in your setting? And so there's some differences. And where I am with New Life Downtown, we're a year and a half into this. We don't have a big budget. We, are, we meet in a rented high school auditorium, the oldest high school in Colorado Springs, right in the middle of downtown. Sometimes our backdrop is the whatever play the high school's doing that month, you know? During Easter last year, it was the man from La Mancha. And the cave looked strikingly like an empty tomb. I mean, it really worked for us. Our lighting guy is the school district's lighting guy who knows how to fade it up and fade it down. I'm with you in this. Am I saying we just need to throw it all away and just, oh my gosh, Glenn's telling us technology is evil. He's one of those guys. I'm not saying that. Technology is in one way a tool, but in another way, it is a very important part of who we are becoming. And there's a whole exploration of this, of our relationship with technology and the idea of human becoming, that our very anthropology changes as we integrate technology. That's a whole other subject. But the point is this, there's no such thing as a neutral tool, that eventually tools shape you and form you and you become different for using them. Not necessarily in bad ways, sometimes in good ways. Glasses are a technology, right? So there's this, I'm not saying it's evil, neither am I saying it's, we should uncritically embrace it all. I'm asking us to think carefully about this and to think about our Sunday services or our church gathered services through the lens of formation. How are these choices forming us? And if you borrow these cultural liturgies, they will form you in particular ways. Over the last several years, I've become intrigued by visiting, along with reading and studying about ancient or historic liturgies. And so I, I, I've, I've a few, several years ago, I went and visited the Anglican church in our town and then an Eastern Orthodox church. And I tell you, the Eastern Orthodox church, this is really fascinating. We came in, my wife and I, and there's no chairs, so we're all just sitting on the floor. I was like, man, that is terrible customer service, you know? sitting on the floor, we're, we're all given a book and we're, we're, we're kind of standing up and sitting down and we're singing and then we're saying and then we're confessing and, we're, and, and everybody kind of knows what to do but they're, they're very sweet and they're guiding you through it. But the liturgy they're working with dates back to the fourth century. These guys are not very concerned about being hip. But the, other, the real thing that got me was how they believed something here at their core, and that is that everything speaks. Everything speaks. My whole talk today could be summed up in those two words, everything speaks. So you walk in, the space speaks. The visuals along the wall speaks. The rituals we were invited into speak. The words obviously speak, everything speaks. And as I began to visit different ones of these, these churches and sit down with their priests and talk with them and, and compliment it with more reading, I began to realize, look, these people who planned these liturgies, these historic Christian liturgies, did so in a very, very thoughtful way. And I began to ask the question, what are they doing and why? What have we changed and why? It's a good question. What are they doing and why? What have we changed and why? I'm not saying you shouldn't change it, you just need to know why you've changed it, okay? And as I began to think through it, I realized, okay, if I were to try to boil it down and say, what are three things that were the, are the marks of a gathering of the people of God when we come together, how do we know this is different from something else? I wanna say these three things. One, that when the people of God gather, it is unapologetically Christ-centered. Christ-centered. 
Say, well, Glenn, okay, good, check. We got it. Of course we want to be Christ. Listen, there is not a minister or, or ministry leader that you could talk to who would say, I don't want to be Christ-centered. I'd rather be me-centered. Everybody says they want to be Christ-centered, okay? Everybody says it. We totally believe it. But I don't think we're thinking hard enough about all the elements of the service reinforcing the Christ-centeredness of it. Man, should I go there? <laughs> There's not a worship band in the country that, it has, uh, that I know of that has asked for their faces to be on the screen. And there's not a tech team in the country who puts their faces on the screen because they want to glorify man. No, of course not. These are all pretty, and I say innocent as in we're, nobody's trying to do harm here. I think they're all pretty innocent decisions. And yet, I think it's time to ask ourselves if we can do better than IMAG. To ask ourselves if we can do better than just to have the camera magnify another person's face. I'll tell you, for all my years traveling the Desperation Band, we play in arenas, all this stuff, you always try to have this pure heart for God, but it's kind of hard when the, you know when the camera's right there. And so you're like doing this and you're like, oh, wait, am I, this is not quite the cool guitar pose. Let me go like this. These things mess with you after a while because these things do change you. Not always in good ways. Some of you are like, wait a minute, Glenn. The form, the form doesn't matter, Glenn. The message matters. Okay. I got an assignment for you. Your next wedding anniversary, if you're married, find a post-it note, write I love you and stick it on the bathroom mirror and tell me that form doesn't matter. So honey, I told you I love you. The message is there, baby. The form was, yeah, whatever, but the message was there. Come on, honey. What? Why don't you let the form reinforce what the message is saying? So if we say we want to be Christ-centered, can the visual and the verbal reinforce one another? Can the visual and the verbal reinforce one another? Can they both point to the same thing? So how might we do that? Okay, okay, listen, here's a very simple idea. A lot of people do this. This is an ancient idea. What if on the center of the stage is the cross and the communion table? <gasps> Turns out this has been done for a lot of years. What if the band is on the side of it? As if to say, we, we believe in leadership, but we really believe that this is the center. That's how our stage is set up downtown. Sometimes seasonally we go more dramatic than that. We've done this thing once when we were doing a Sunday night service where during the season of, of Lent, which is a big step for a non-denominational charismatic church to observe Lent, try introducing that. Eee. Navigating those conversations Try to explain it. So once during Lent, people walked in on the first Sunday of Lent and all the chairs were facing the back wall. And the only thing on the back wall was a very sparse, rugged wooden cross and then, you know, white lyrics against the wall. And the band was here playing and leaning. And it, it, the best was seeing people walk in 10 minutes late, you know. They're just coming in, looking at their phone. But, oh, Oh my God, why is everybody facing me, you know? I thought I was gonna hang in the back today. Oh, the back is the front, the front is the back. It's, oh yeah. And we always say to people, worship leaders, we say to people all the time, listen, I'm not the point, I am not here, it's not about me, it's not about me, it's not about me. It's, okay, great. Once in a while, why don't you really embody that it's not about you, right? Once in a while, turn all the chairs away from you. Once in a while, if you're in a bigger budget church, put a scrim down over the band and project beautiful visuals over that. So if it's not really about you, okay, let's take your, I'll take your word for it. What bothers me is when I, I see Instagram pic after Instagram pic of like big events after big events after big events and some big Christian band is leading worship and they're beautiful hearted beautifully hearted people that say wonderful things like it's all about Jesus. 
But every picture is their mugshot on a big screen. And every Instagram pic is lights going on the band and they're like, so much Jesus. I believe you, but I don't see why we can't use our technology to reinforce that same message. Why make the leader work against the, in his environment? Aren't we creative enough to let the environment reinforce the hearts of the people in minute, on the stage, right? Can't we, do, can't, we can't come up with any better ideas than borrowing a, a, a liturgy from the Grammys? Okay, all right, okay. There's your challenge. Christ-centered. I think for pastors, for preachers in the room, the other, the other way to let Christ be unapologetically the center has to do with how we end sermons. Very often we end sermons with the, okay, now come on and do it. Come on and get out there. That's not Christ-centered, right? There's some great teaching and literature out there to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, if we're gonna be Christ-centered, we've gotta make the beeline back to the cross to say, and this is how we fall short, and yet this is how Christ is more than enough for us, and this is how the Spirit is poured out among us to enable us to imitate Christ. All of this stuff. So even the way we're preaching doesn't become all about you, but centers on Christ. So there's a challenge in this for all of us. Yeah, I've had to learn to preach differently over the last couple of years. So am I leaving people with a, wow, that was a great oratory, or am I leaving people with saying, and there is Jesus? The second thing is this idea of being gospel shaped. Gospel shaped. What do you mean by gospel shape? See, what I learned about these, these people that crafted the historic Christian liturgies is that they made sure that in one service, one order of service, if you will, it reenacted the gospel narrative. Those of you who've come from, from traditional backgrounds, you remember this. You start with the Ten Commandments and then the confession of sin and then this thing and then there's com- the scripture readings and then there's the, you know, a short sermon and then communion. All of this stuff is meant to kind of take you through a gospel-shaped story. We aren't thinking like storytellers. We're thinking like entertainers. We're thinking about magazine format shows, variety shows, where we, okay, we got this segment, and then we got this segment, and then we got this segment. It's fine, that's fine, it's not evil. I just think we can do better. I think there's something better than variety show church services. I think there's something better than entertainment values. I think there's something better. And what it is, is these storytelling sensibilities. The sense in which a whole service tells a narrative. Everything kind of works together. Maybe the missing ingredient in making a service have a narrative is really the ingredient of some kind of corporate confession. So we don't like that, you know. I mean, I'm. I know, and I've been in the church world a long time. We want services to make it peppy, make it snappy, right? Come on. None of these lover's lament stuff. I mean, I just want want it to be upbeat. Keep it moving. No dead space. And so there's not a moment for confession. But if there's no space for confession, there's no conflict in the story. Any of you that love a good movie or a good book or a good story, you understand the essential piece of a good story is conflict. And what's the conflict in the Christian story? The conflict in the gospel narrative is for all have sinned and have fallen short. There's something here that I can't do exactly what you're saying unless I have Jesus and unless the Spirit, right? All of this stuff. And if the service is going to feel like a narrative, a gospel-shaped narrative that, that, in, that lifts us up and says, live this way, and then brings us down and says, but without Jesus, this is impossible, and then leads us to the cross where we confess our dependence on Christ, and we say, thank you, God, for the Spirit, and then we worship and we celebrate and we're sent out into the world. If the service doesn't have a narrative like that, all we're doing is trying to keep the people happy for 90 minutes with segments that we've produced that line up with our brand, I think we can do better. The way the historic liturgies used to make sure that their services 
shaped around the gospel stories, they had something that was the center of their worship. Do you know what it was? The communion table. It was the center of peace. And whether they put it at the end or they put it in the middle, it was the thing that everything was built around. Now I know we, we have all different views of, of thinking about the table and understanding, I, I, I get it and that's okay. But there's something special about the table. And I won't go into a long talk on this here, I just wanna say this one thing. We can talk about there being several places of encounter in the service. We encounter God as we sing, we encounter God as the scriptures being taught and read. But we also encounter God at the table, but do you know what's different to, at least throughout church history, the way we've talked about the table, what's different about encountering God there versus in some of these other places? And especially for us today, is your encounter with God through the singing greatly depends on the skill of the worship team. So if it's too loud or not the songs you know, your encounter quotient goes down, right? You're like, eh. But if something you really like, you know, one hand. If something you really like, two hands, baby, I'm in. Woo! The glory showed up. Same thing with a sermon. If a preacher says what you already think, it's a good sermon. If some guy who you've never met is challenging all your boxes, you're like, whatever, man, that was a weird closing talk. <laughs> but when you come to the table, you don't bring anything to this meal. The Lord's Supper is not a potluck. At the table, we say, God, I've got nothing. And he says, it's all right, I am everything. And I'm yours. My body is your bread, my blood is your cup, I am your portion. When we come to the table, it, it, it's just, the human element seems to be dis diminished quite a bit. There's something there that shapes our services. At New Life, both at the main campus and at our downtown thing, we've, we've switched now to doing communion every week. I know that's weird for like a non-denominational church. Really weird. So people are like, what? Why are we doing this? It's kind of a logistical nightmare. A pastor said that once. We would do communion every week, but it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. But apparently the offering is not a logistical nightmare, so we can do that every week. <laughs> Understanding how we're forming people. So our pastor decided we're gonna do communion every week. We're gonna teach our people to not depend on a, a man or an experience. We're gonna teach people to come with empty hands to the feast that Jesus is. It's a slow work, but it's a good one. Final thing here is spirit led. I've already kind of showed you my hand. I said that the church that I'm part of believes and embraces the, whole, the moves of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, and all this stuff. So you might be wondering what I mean when I say Spirit-led. I want to tell you that I don't mean Spirit-led as in loosey-goosey, you know? Like, hey, whatever the Spirit's leading, so it turns out I'm not going to preach, you know? Like, the Spirit can lead that way, for sure. But the Spirit is not always spontaneous, just so we know. Sometimes the spirit is right on a schedule, amazing. But when I say spirit led, I'm thinking of the day of Pentecost. What happens at the day of Pentecost is that all of these people from different regions begin to hear Jesus proclaim, the gospel proclaimed in their own language. It's a miracle. These people who don't speak the language of their day all of a sudden start speaking the language of their day not to say, hi, how are you? Can you tell me where the bathroom is? But to say, this is Jesus. This Jesus is Lord. And after all I've pushed by challenging you to think about a cultural liturgy, I want to come back and affirm something. And that is that we need to speak the language of our culture. Even while we're suspicious of the quote unquote liturgies of our culture, we must be skilled by the Spirit to speak the language of our culture. And here's what I mean by that. 
I think it is the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment and says, what is my city like? What is my church like? What is our community like? Who are these people? What language do they speak? Now, how can we in their own language point them to Jesus and tell the gospel, right? That's what it means to let the Spirit kind of lead us. So if you were hoping that I would give you one size fits all, here you go, this is the key. I don't have it because it doesn't exist. Sometimes people come up to me and say, Glenn, do you think that we should all like be liturgical? And what they mean by that is like, you know, incorporating some Anglican things or whatever. Do you think, is, are, you try, are you on a mission to make us all like, it's like, no, no, but what church wouldn't want to be Christ-centered, gospel-shaped? All of us want that. In fact, I don't think, and I want to say this again, I don't think anybody is making the decisions that we've made about production and all of this stuff because we have bad hearts. I don't believe that for a second. Every person I know who serves in churches, almost every person I know who serves in churches, have have great hearts and great intentions. But nobody's challenged us to think more deeply than we've been thinking. And so we look at something and say, that's cool, man, we're going to do that. Did you hear what they're doing over that church? Ooh, we're gonna do that. And nobody's stopping to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, are you sure that's the best way to make all of the elements, all the spoken and seen and the visual and the lights and the images and the audio, and are we sure this is the best way to make everything point to Jesus and tell the gospel narrative? Are we sure? And if you can say, I think this is the best we can do with what we have, it's all right, God bless you. Let the Spirit lead you in that. Let the Spirit be the one to say, all right, this is, this is how you have to imagine it. This is how you have to shape it. This is how you tweak things and change things. May everything that is said and sung and done point to Jesus and retell the gospel narrative. By the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now to end this, as I have said that I'm learning to do, I don't wanna end this with, okay guys, you got it? Now come on, get out there. I wanna end this with us singing a confession. These are words based on a very old prayer of confession. And I think they'll be up. And if you would, just kind of bow your heads and be quiet before the Lord. It's been a good week. So many great people and so many great ideas. I think of the great artisans who use the best of their skills and the best of the technology of their days to build cathedrals with windows that told a story. So you can use technology to entertain or you can use technology to illuminate. May we all be illuminators. Reveal Jesus. Retell the gospel narrative. Because what we do when we facilitate these gatherings of the church is sacred. It's a holy thing. We're forming people in their faith. And that's more than I can handle. And that's more than you can handle. And so we're going to turn to the Lord. And when we confess, it's not about being shamed. And it's not about beating yourself up. Confession can be the most freeing thing ever because it's our way of saying, God, uh uh-huh. I don't got this. I don't have this. Okay, I can't. This is overwhelming. And he says, yeah, but I've got you.
have done what we have left undone we have not loved you with our whole heart we have Sing this verse with me, Almighty God. Almighty God, we confess our sin. What we have done, what we have left undone. We have singing over you. Forgive, forgive, we are 
Sing that chorus one last time. Sing thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit, your 